Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So many of you know I've been diving into Chuck Acre and Acre Capital Management recently. One of the things that really sticks out to me about Chuck Acre and the way he operates his fund uh, is there's a commitment to simplicity. Okay, he was an English major, all right, before he started his fund. So he's coming at this from a very different background than most fund managers do. And along those lines, being an English major, uh, he thinks if, if you really understand a business, you should be able to encapsulate what makes it great in a paragraph or even a sentence. Uh, and I, I noticed this article from Barron's about Acre Capital Management, at least two managers who work at Acre Capital Management. And there's a couple companies in here that they talk about. I just, I was really impressed by how succinctly they were able to describe, you know, what these companies do and what gives them a sustainable competitive advantage. So uh, a couple of companies mentioned here, Moody's, Constellation Software, um, those are kind of the big two. Dollar Tree is also mentioned. So I just want to rip through this article real quick and just highlight some of these things. Um, the clarity of thinking that goes into, you know, really understanding a business and how to communicate that to others. So uh, let's dig into this one. This was published last summer, July of 2021. This fund delivers big tech gains without big tech. Uh, and this is highlighting John Neff and Chris Cerrone of Acre Focus Fund. So the Acre Focus Fund looks a bit different since legendary investor Chuck Acre began turning over the reins, but the goal is still transcendence. The duo still buys the companies Acre described in the late 1980s as the nirvana in investing superior businesses that are exceptionally well managed. Over the last couple of years, the pair have found more nirvana in technology and less in the financials and insurers that Acre favored years ago and helped the fund earn an average annual return of 19% over the past decade, beating 89% of its peers. So they still run a concentrated fund around 20 stocks. Um, so Neff began co-managing the fund in 2014. Cerrone worked as an analyst for years before becoming co-manager a year ago. So let's get into some questions here. Barons, you look for quality companies. What does that mean and where are you finding them? John Neff, we're talking about durable competitive advantage, and that has to be something we can understand and monitor. It's why a business wins and why it should continue to disproportionately win. For example, uh, Moody's is a quantitatively outstanding business in terms of its margins, return on capital, and long-term growth. But our investment centers on its competitive advantage. Moody's acts as a toll bridge to the capital markets for debt issuers of all stripes. The fundamental product that Moody's sells to debt issuers is credibility with debt investors. Moody's has built its credibility for its credit ratings over the past 120 plus years over every economic cycle. Now, I'm pretty sure Moody's was pitched to Chuck Acre soon after the, the global financial crisis, okay? After blood was in the streets in 2008. And Acre's first thought was, they're all crooks, right? How could we possibly invest in a company that was selling, you know, debt as as AAA, as safe, uh, when when it clearly wasn't, when it was really just built on a house of cards? Uh, but Acre met with management of Moody's, and over time saw that, you know, there there wasn't something nefarious going on. He, he thinks they were acting. Uh, reasonably. So it'd be interesting to hear more details from, from Chuck Acre on that. But, you know, reading this, I just think, well, what about 2008, right? Or, or, or yeah, 2008. It, it's, 
you know, hard to not point the finger at Moody's for a lot of that. But how does a newer competitor with less credibility to sell a debt issuer tend to compete with Moody's? They tend to offer higher ratings, a lower price or both. But competing that way undermines the already much lower credibility those competitors have in the first place. That makes for a powerful competitive advantage for Moody's and explains why we've always believed the credit ratings business to be a natural oligopoly. So it's kind of Moody's in a nutshell from Acre Capital Management. Your fund has more in technology than in the past, but just two thirds as much as average large cap growth fund, uh, according to Morningstar. Why? Industry classifications can be misleading. Okay, Moody's is categorized as a financial company, but neither lends nor invests money. CarMax is categorized as consumer discretionary, but makes roughly half of its earnings from auto loans. Um, so, you know, tech tech is probably painting things with, with too broad a brush, at least. That's the perspective of uh, Acre. You own several software companies. What is the draw? Chris responds, a business like a software company has network effects. The more people who use it, the stronger it gets. That makes it much more difficult for even a better product to take those customers away. Switching costs are so enormous that it's unthinkable somebody would rip out and put in something else, or there's a complete lack of alternatives. Those are the businesses you can hang your hat on without being a technologist. Uh, what is a software company that fits this profile? Constellation Software in Canada. You take all the attractive aspects of a software business, the essential nature of the product, a great business model, high margins, and a great runway for software to continue impacting new areas of our lives, and marry that to one of the best capital allocators of our generation and founder, Mark Leonard, who started off as a venture capital investor. Mark created Constellation in 1995, acquiring small vertical market software businesses, those focusing on just one niche market, like software for a bowling alley or a golf course. He's a brilliant case study on capital allocation and governance of a large organization. There truly is a feeling of trusteeship, which to me means fiduciary duty to the shareholders. Mark also has skin in the game. He and his interests own just shy of 7% of the company, collectively over $2 billion. As part of the compensation structure, instead of receiving, receiving stock options, he gives employees a cash bonus but requires them to buy shares. Okay. That seems a bit odd uh, at first glance. Why is insisting employees buy shares better than stock options? There's no dilution, and they are consciously clicking a button to say, I want to buy these shares, which leads to a psychologically different experience than receiving shares for free. Right? There's more of an ownership mindset there than an employee mindset. Uh, you own fewer financials than in the past, but own alternative firms KKR and Brookfield Asset Management. What makes them different? Chris Cerrone, we are trying to harness big secular trends, companies with the wind at their back. That includes the enormous shift of sovereign wealth funds, large public pension plans, and other institutional investors moving trillions of dollars out of stocks and bonds. When you think of the situation now in the U.S., um, where you know the market seems bubble-esque to to many, you know, it'd be uh, it's pretty easy to make the case that we're in a bubble in the U.S. markets uh, and bonds. I mean. Who's really interested in bonds now uh, with, with the rates that you get investing in bonds? So um, moving dollars out of stocks and bonds into alternative asset classes like private equity, real estate, infrastructure, and private credit. In 2000, most large institutional investors were targeting a 5% allocation to alternative asset classes. Most recently, that has been about 25%. Okay, so that is a huge shift. Uh, if you believe Brookfield CEO Bruce Flatt's long-term assessment that we're in a low growth, low interest rate environment, that allocation could reach north of 50%. So we're talking about as much as 25 trillion of capital 
rotating out of other asset classes into alternatives over the next decade or so. The managers of those alternative assets could be really interesting. So why those two, why KKR and Brookfield Asset Management? It goes back to their approach to reinvestment and culture. So for those of you who haven't studied uh, Acre's fund, they go by the three-legged stool, okay? And the three legs are high return on capital, um, high rate of reinvestment, and I believe the other one is management. You know, management that you know is skilled to to grow the company for a long time and has proper incentives to you know return that value to shareholders and not just collect it for itself. So reinvestment is the the leg of the stool. Cerrone is pointing out here goes back to their approach to reinvestment and culture. Blackstone Group, Apollo Global Management, and Carlyle Group pay out the vast majority of cash flow through variable distributions to their shareholders. KKR did that until the co-founders and leadership realized there was a cost to distributing that cash flow. If they were to hold onto businesses for longer or reinvest the cash from selling businesses, there was a great compounding opportunity. Brookfield similarly has a retain cash flow and reinvest mentality. So I mean, that reinvestment is so important to compounding over the long term. Um, and Acre talked about that a lot. Both are also unique culturally. Everyone's compensated based on the success of the firm as a whole. It's less of a mercenary eat what you kill situation that really appeals to us. It's how we structure our business. KKR is probably pretty fairly valued here. At today's prices, it suggests a mid-teens return, which means you double your money in five years. Nothing to sneeze at, right? Um, I mean, if you look at historical stock market returns over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, it's probably eight to 10%. So, you know, if, if you're getting a mid-teens return uh, in a company that, you know, you feel comfortable that the downside risk is, is limited, uh, that could be pretty attractive. But it sounds like Acre's, you know, they, they're really targeting something higher than a, than a mid-teens return. Uh, we may see higher interest rates in the not-too-distant future. How does that affect your thinking? Rising interest rates, if they are consistent with inflation, will be a new investment regime. I mean, if you look over the last 40 years in the U.S. stock market, rates have just consistently come down over the last four decades. So we are entering a new territory here. If we were to move to a higher interest rate, higher inflation environment, having high returns on tangible capital is going to be a very important consideration. Our portfolio average had in March of 2021, 179% return on gross tangible capital, which is astronomically high. Uh, the businesses we own don't need a great deal of tangible capital to operate and earn very high returns and high margins. The higher the returns on the tangible capital needed to support the sales and earnings of a business, the more efficiently and profitably a business can stay ahead of inflation. Uh, and then this is the last section I'll cover. Are you concerned about inflation? We invest in all weather businesses. That said, you can see the impact of wage inflation and higher energy prices on some retailers like Dollar Tree, which pays for a substantial amount of their products to be shipped from overseas. Uh, inflation has averaged 2.5% per year since Dollar Tree opened its first $1 only store in 1986. Against all odds, they have maintained the $1 only price point. They have some of the best margins in all of retail, helped by its purchasing scale, buying direct from suppliers overseas, and tight supply chain management. All of that gives us confidence that they will navigate today's inflationary challenges. I want to... This, this kind of blew my mind, right? Thinking, you know, to be a company that is committed to only sell products for a dollar, you know, 
as that is a major headwind, right? Inflation uh, over the last 1986, what is that, 35 years or so? That's remarkable. Uh, I would not like to take that take that on, but Dollar Tree's done pretty well. That said, I noticed in the latest 13F filing for Acre Capital Management, they are trimming Dollar Tree, okay? They sold 26% of their position in the fourth quarter of 2021. So, um, and I think Chris Cerrone talked a little bit about Dollar Tree in his podcast with Bill Brewster. I think it was just a month, maybe a month and a half ago. So uh, also an excellent podcast if you're you're interested in learning more um, from Chuck Ockray and, and Chuck, Ock, Chuck Ockray's fund. But you can see here Moody's, currently the biggest holding in Ockray Capital Management. And then MasterCard, American Tower, Visa, O'Reilly, some just incredible long-term compounders there. Uh, Acre has like a museum of, of great compounders here. It's pretty impressive uh, what he's put together in the portfolio. But yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover, guys. Um, you know, it, it, it's really insightful looking at how, you know, these managers at Acre talk about companies. Now, there's so much packed into each sentence. Clearly, uh, incredibly knowledgeable about these businesses and, and really what makes them tick and what to pay attention to going forward to, to really make sure, you know, is the thesis still intact here? Are these still great companies? Um, or is there something that's cracking in the durable competitive advantage? So just wanted to point out this article. It's probably the best Barron's article I've ever read. Um, so I will link to it in the description. Spend some time with it. I also noticed at the beginning, it looks like there's an option to listen. Listen to the article. It's just five minutes. So if you're on the road and you don't have time to sit down and read through it, it's probably worth listening to. Um, but yeah, just wanted to share this these insights from Chuck Acre and his team over at Acre Capital Management. And... Uh, that's all I got for today, guys. See you all in the next video. Take care.